I am Andrus Kulikowskis. This is Math for Wisdom. A meeting of our study group on the mathematics of the divisions of everything, which are the fundamentals of wondrous wisdom. And I am with uh, John Harland of Palomar College. Hello, John. Hello. And uh, today I will explain to John uh, my best efforts to understand bot periodicity. I've gotten close enough to where I can maybe say something of what I'm trying to do. And really, this is about asking for your help. Maybe you know something about bot periodicity more than I do. And that's quite possible. But maybe um, this is a milestone in where our research is going. And um, maybe it'll be interesting. Maybe it'll shine some light for you. So bot periodicity uh, was... Uh, discovered in 1959 or published in 1959 by Bott. Uh, he used Morse theory. And it's an eightfold periodicity uh, that uh, he described in homotopy theory. So I'll go through these notes. Uh, these are for me uh, to talk and so they, they may be rather scattered, but uh, it's um, in homotopy theory, which is an algebraic topology, you have this uh, whole toolkit of uh, analyzing, um, investigating a space, a topological space X, by uh, looking at maps from various types of spheres, which could be simply a loop, for example. So a loop would be uh, in S, it's S1. It's a map from a circle into the space, yields a loop. Uh, and so that'd be a one-dimensional loop, but you could look at a two-dimensional uh, sphere. You could look at a three-dimensional sphere, four-dimensional sphere, and so on. And when you study these loops, um, you get what are called homotopy groups. So in the case of a loop or a sphere, you can say, well, lots of loops. Um, and you, for this, basically, the way it works is you need to choose a point. So you'll choose a point in your space X called a base point. And so uh, you'll choose a point in, the, let's say, circle. And you're mapping from the circle, the base point, let's say, A. And then F of A will be a point B in the space that you're interested in that you're studying. And so when you do this, um, you'll map a loop. You'll have lots and lots of loops. But basically, they'll come um, into classes. So for example, if you're looking from maps uh, from a loop to the circle itself, well, the loops may go on and on and on in that loop. But basically, when you, when you stretch them, when you modify them, they'll give you winding numbers. So maybe it'll just all shrink to a point but maybe it'll wrap around once or twice or three times. And so those would all be given different classes or you could go in the opposite direction. Those would be, let's say the negatives. This gives you the group, which would be Z, the counting numbers. Um, so um, the, the integers. So what so happens can, is- Can I interrupt just a moment? Yes, um, as you o, like. O infinity, you're saying the inductive limit of orthogonal groups. Can you unpack that a little bit? Yes, uh, so we've been um, studying Lie groups, and the key one that relates to the real numbers is the orthogonal group, um, which tells you, um, let's say for a sphere, it would tell you the um, rotations, uh, but also the reflections, okay, so that you can reflect across. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the things you can do to a sphere that would map the sphere into itself. Um, and so then for the special orthogonal group, you, know, you would not do the reflections. Um, so... Uh, but O infinity, so you can define the orthogonal group um, in two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions for the um, analogous real sphere. Now, these things sit inside each other. So mm -hmm. like, uh, the, like rotating a circle is sitting inside rotating a sphere, mm -hmm. which is sitting inside rotating a four-dimensional, uh, you know, basically would it be mm -hmm. a three-dimensional sphere in four dimensions, and so on and so on and so on. You could take that whole limit of all these uh, structures and unify them that way. And there may be advantages to that because you could uh, think of them all in one fell swoop, let's say, right? So that would be called O infinity. Okay. And so now you can ask yourself, okay, I have this uh, humongous O infinity, all these rotations and all these possible dimensions. Uh, what would their homotopy groups be? So pi of zero would be the number of pieces of it. Pi of one would be the what you get in terms of the classes of loops. Uh, so pi sub two. You're saying there's two pieces. 
because there's reflections, I, reflections and and rotations. There's that's two, my guess. <laughs> that's your guess. There. I think that's that's that must be that's probably what they're saying. But I think that's what they're saying. You know, I'm talking way above my head. Okay. I think it's uh, those are the two. You know, with including the reflection, an a reflection or not. Okay. Um, and then, of course, like if you reflect twice, you're back to where you started, so the reflection goes away. And then uh, for uh, one, um, there's something similar. So the, the first is that there's two pieces. I think that there are two connected pieces. So that's just saying that there, um, for whatever reason, like when you put them all together, you get two pieces, and that may be related to the reflection also. That they're just simply not connected. Uh, then. Um, in terms of the loops, somehow, like, um, there will be two kinds of loops. And this may be related, I'm just guessing, but to, like, the whole notion of spinners, right? Like, where you could uh, be going once around or you could be going twice around, right? Okay. If you go once, once around, that'll give you, you know, then you get a change of state to from state one to state minus one, right? Whereas if you go twice around, you will go... Uh, uh, from one back to one. So going once around and going twice around, let's say, would be different, but going three times around would be the same as going around once. You know, it's an odd or even type of thing. I'm not sure, but that's kind of like the guess. But somehow, when you get to talking not about loops mapping into this uh, wonderful creature, but when you talk about uh, spheres, uh, two-dimensional spheres in, three, in 3D, and you map those in, then everything collapses to a point. OK. Mm. Um, when you throw up it up to another dimension, you'll get Z. So Z is something like that winding number, right, where it's wrapping around, wrapping around, wrapping around, wrapping around uh, somehow um, in one direction and in the other direction. So you get this very remarkable pattern, uh, Z2, Z2, 0, Z, 0, 0, 0, Z. You know, someday maybe it'll be a children's song. but. Um, or the days of the week, or whatever, I don't know. But uh, it's eightfold. And so what Bot showed was that it repeats, you see. And this was a hugely unexpected thing, and very miraculous and stunning. And it connects to a lot of deep things in math, very difficult problems. So one of the huge difficult problems of the time, and I think this was, you know, just as homotopy theory was being uh, invented, like in the 30s and 40s, so this is 59. They were trying to, let's say, uh, look at the homotopy groups of spheres, which would be basically saying, well, you know, how do you map uh, m-dimensional spheres into n-dimensional spheres? You know, what does that all look like? So that would be like how these spheres wrap around each other. That turns out uh, to this day to be like an intractable problem. It's very difficult. And it's especially difficult, like with like if m and n are kind of like um, the same size, or I guess like if one is less than the other, it, it's just completely chaotic. Um, but if you look at the limit where, like, I guess they say here, where k is n is greater than or equal to k plus 2, it turns out, then, and so I don't know about this, but there's this J homomorphism, which uh, maps, uh, let's say, which deals with, let's say, with the case of the special orthogonals. So that'd be, let's say, half of these uh, rotations, I presume. And then um, the ones that uh, don't reflect. And then it turns out that um, in those conditions, um, Pi sub k uh, is uh, periodic in k uh, modulo 8. There's an eightfold pattern. And so that'll give you um, like either a cyclic group or a trivial group, or instead of this z, it will give you, um, and I messed up my uh, latex here, but it'll get you uh, the Bernoulli numbers, uh, b sub 2m, which are related to, um, which are related to like ways of, writing out alternating permutations, but they're related to, uh, Bernoulli invented them to calculate sums of powers. And so they end up being related like to the Riemann uh, zeta function. Mm -hmm. So something very basic like that uh, is just popping in there, right? Which will yield these very large numbers uh, in particular cases, uh, three comma seven mod eight. That's just an introduction just to say like, this was a big deal in math. Now in Wondrous Wisdom, which is um, the whole, uh, so you're saying of, it, it, it mm -hmm. solved it solved the homotopy kind of embedding problem in certain cases. You're saying in in yeah, and we can look at the uh, on the Wikipedia page on that. So here's like, and I don't understand this, but uh, here's this uh, chart. You see, 
So, and I'm not exactly sure where this is coming in. I think it may come into uh, when 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 one of the dimensions is large. So maybe that is. Uh, but you could just see it's complicated. It's a very complicated, yeah. messy thing. And then, like like here, it's like you know they just do all kinds of things here, right? Like it's just becoming super complicated. But you're saying that you can, but period. Periodicity, but periodicity may be over here, right? Like you see, it's like infinity to 224, 2, 240. See, these would be the Bernoulli numbers, 240. Okay. They were like 1, 2, 3, 4. And somehow, see, when you get close, you get this kind of like noise. When you get here, you get this utter chaos. But if mm. you are big enough, you get order. Okay. Okay. So this is some kind of like context for this chaos. Okay. Okay. So now for um, why did I become interested in this? Well, you know, I was studying, um, I was, this was like 2016. I was, um, you know, since uh, childhood, but to certainly since 1982, I've been developing this language of wondrous wisdom. Um, and this has resulted in a language of cognitive frameworks that are called divisions of everything. And when I was 24 years old, so that was back in 1989, I realized that they form an eight cycle. And that uh, these are basically like mental states. And so you're a bit familiar with this. Uh, um, but uh, just to say that, uh, you know, that you have these mental shifts. So like if you reflect directly, then you would add one perspective. If you reflected on the reflection, that'd be like consciousness. You, you get two perspectives. And if you try to balance those, you get three perspectives. And so you end up with these shifts that uh, form this periodic uh, system. So the question is, how would that... Um, how would that relate possibly to bot periodicity when I found out about this eightfold thing? Because now, of course, eightfold, this is um, just a coincidence, but uh, what is the evidence that this could be more than a coincidence? Maybe just take a quick uh, refresher look at these uh, divisions of everything. This is the one for uh, division of everything to five, um, but um, th this is the very fundamental ones. Uh, the two sum goes saying that opposites coexist or all is the same. This is kind of like the complex numbers. Um, the threesome says there's a learning cycle of taking a stand, following through, reflecting, a little bit like the three cycle in the quaternions. Uh, this is the foursome for knowledge, uh, saying there's four levels, whether, what, how, why. Also another way to look at the quaternions, you know, as two sets of uh, complexes. So and then you have uh, uh, representations of that, like you have uh, conceptions of that, you have this fivefold, you have a, you have a sixfold. Then the crucial thing is that when you get a sevenfold framework for logic, um, that's you get like a self-standing system. So what I'm describing with these divisions of everything that I've been documenting is how you might start from a state of contradiction and add premises, premises, premises until you get a very fragile but but um, fascinating uh, self uh, consistent logical system where you can distinguish between yes and no and things like that almost like uh, constructing a division. But if you add an eighth perspective in this logical square, let's say like all are good and all are bad, then then it's just uh, collapses, you know, because if everything is good and everything is bad, then that distinction means nothing or the, simply the system is empty. If the system is empty, then you have nothing. So it all collapses. So that's in my uh, wondrous wisdom documenting that, uh, that's the reason we have this eightfold periodicity. Now, so, okay, so here's another eightfold periodicity. Is there any chance they could be the same, you know, on some level? So bot periodicity has many manifestations and we'll talk about some of them, um, but they're very metaphysical, which is kind of interesting. So starting with those homotopy groups, spheres mapping to spheres may somehow model perspectives possibly, right? It's not uh, crazy to think that, well, hmm, so that's one clue, but there's other clues. Uh, We'll be looking at, um, let's see, uh, well, so for example, in physics, uh, well, so first of all, there's symmetric spaces, okay? So it turns out that one way to think about these um, orthogonal things, like you saw the orthogonal group is involved, but there's a whole chain of these classical Lie groups and Lie families. Uh, so uh, it's not just rotations in the reals, but it could be rotations in the complexes, which would be the unitary, or rotations in the quaternions, which would be the Hamiltonian. You, know, you can change your norm in different ways. So 
they have these embeddings here. So like orthogonal cross orthogonal is embedded in the orthogonal, is embedded in the unitary, is embedded in the symplectic, is embedded in the symplectic cross symplectic, is embedded back into the symplectic, is embedded in the unitary, is embedded in the orthogonal, is embedded in the orthogonal cross orthogonal. So you get this eightfold embedding, uh, which would be sitting all in that O infinity that we talked about. There's a simpler embedding that just focuses on the unitary. So U cross U is a subset of uh, U, I guess subgroup, I think it's more accurate, subgroup of U cross U. And so you get a similar thing, uh, where's this coming from? And so one of the places it's connected- seems to be a, So you're saying, it is, is that, is that a, a true statement like U? It looks like U cross U is embedded in U, but that's embedded in U cross U. That looks like a kind of a bilateral embedding. Is that, is that am I I think, you know, they're not, uh, they're, I'm not exactly sure, you know, what this all means. So, you know, that's, I have to apologize. But I think it's like if U of N cross U of N is a subset, it's in U of 2 of N, 2 N, right? Okay. And then U of 2 N is in uh, U of 2 N cross U of 2 N, among other things, right? Okay. And so you would get that kind of chain. Right. But in O infinity, you get them all, you see. So then somehow, like, um, if you're focusing on O infinity or things like that, right, or U infinity, right, like, you know, you would get these types of massive uh, infinite structures. Uh, so it's something like that. Now, the crucial thing, and then Clifford algebras, like orthogonals relate to the reals, uh, unitary relates to the complexes, Hamiltonians uh, relate to the, you know, I mean, symplectic relates to the quaternions. So you actually, uh, in Clifford algebras, you get a similar type of um, embedding uh, uh, where like R plus R is within R. But see here, we have to add uh, the appropriate, this would really be R uh, two by two matrices in R. That's what this would really mean to say. Two by two matrices in R are in um, four by four matrices, let's see how would it would be, two by two matrices of complexes in two by two matrices of Hamiltonians. And then if you take those matrices and you add them to themselves and then put that in four by four matrices of Hamiltonians, you see, I mean, quaternions, I'm sorry. So uh, that goes up like that, that, that. So, uh, and then in the case of the complexes is a simpler way to do it. Uh, just focus on the complexes. Uh, oh, for the for clever averages over complex numbers, we'll go into that distinction. Um, but this is a typical distinction where, like, uh, we if you're working with complex numbers and you have a vector space, um, those complex numbers can reach into lots of places, and and they um, don't um, segregate plus one and minus one, basically. You know, in whereas in the real case, you know, like if you have x squared plus one somehow something of that form, you can't get the minus one that you might like to have, let's say, right? I mean, the other uh, I, the square root of minus one you might have. So um, anyway, so this is, this is related patterns. And so what really matters for bot periodicity though, it seems is the quotients. And then if you look at those quotients, uh, you and I and others at Math from Wisdom, uh, well, at least I think you saw, I forget, but, you, you saw the talk um, on, by John Baez on the symmetric spaces. So they are these quotients, okay? And those quotients are different symmetric spaces where um, you can take a space at any point and you have like a tangent vector. And if you flip it to the negative tangent vector, that'll all work out. Okay, so it turns out that's a very strict type of symmetry. Now, those symmetries happen to relate to all different kinds of Hamiltonians. Oh, also, sorry, can, the can you repeat that symmetry one more time? I think the way it works, and I may get this wrong, but a symmetric space would be a space where at every point, you know, you look at the tangent. Uh, so I guess it must be embedded in some space. But, you know, if, if you have a point, if you have a space embedded in some ambient space, I suppose, and you have a tangent space, and you pick a tangent vector at that point, then there will be a opposite. Uh, you know, you can flip around all the vectors uh, with their minus vectors, and you'll the symmetric space won't matter. Is that maybe like a local symmetry, so to speak? Um, but don't all manifolds have that property? Um, um, just thinking a general manifold. You can go in both directions through through say a point and get the opposite tangent vector if you differentiated that path. Uh, 
I'm not quite sure I understand. So, there may, so there's maybe something more to it than that? I don't know. There is. So we'll have to, we'll have to check that out. Um, yeah, the, the flip we'll, is, we can, Maybe at the end we'll check that out. So I think the flip is, are, more, is a little bit more involved, um, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Hello, I'm going to jump right in and explain what I figured out afterwards. Uh, there's... Um, in defining a symmetric space, there's two things going on. One is that we're looking at an isometry at uh, the point P. And so there needs to exist uh, an isometry such that uh, on the tangent space, it will act as minus the identity. So those two things are coming together. That's what I was missing. And just to review uh, for myself and others, uh, a Riemannian manifold is a real smooth manifold, uh, which has a structure that allows for differentiation, equipped with a positive definite inner product, uh, G at uh, point P, on the tangent space, uh, uh, tangent space T sub P uh, M at each point P. And an isometry is a distance-preserving transformation. So we have this notion of distance from the inner product. We have the isometry. And then um, the manifold uh, M comma G is said to be a symmetric space if and only if for every single point P of M, there exists an isometry of M which fixes P and acts on that tangent space uh, T sub P M as minus the identity. And so the picture that I was showing, um, it makes sense because... Um, there is an isometry that takes the circle to the circle uh, by flipping it. And uh, for that particular isometry, it will take um, a vector pointing in one direction and uh, it will, a, a tangent vector pointing in one direction will get mapped to a tangent vector pointing in the opposite direction. So you have these uh, symmetries, uh, you have these quotients, and then I'll talk about the Clifford algebra. So. Because I my background in algebraic combinatorics, uh, and I think maybe not just for me, but like Clifford algebra, you'll see it is very hand on. It's something that can be explained to people who are you know at the community college level potentially, and if they're teachers or or students, you know who are uh, really into math, uh, using concepts like matrices uh, and binomial theorem, uh, it's possible to talk about Clifford algebras as needed for this, um, and so. Uh, that's what I'm trying to, that's my kind of more like my level. I've been studying uh, some of the basics of algebraic topology, but certainly uh, have a long way to go to understand. Uh, uh, basically, bot periodicity is a statement in K theory. So K theory, when we were uh, in graduate school at the University of California, San Diego, I overheard uh, some professors talking in the library that like, that is the most abstract, you know, difficult branch of mathematics. And uh, certainly, it was one that uh, Grotendieck uh, was central in inventing, uh, and so Atiyah and Bot uh, were using. Uh, that's how. Um, that's the so Bot periodicity is kind of like the foundation. Uh, it's certainly in complex numbers, and K theory has to do with vector uh, bundles. So it could be real bu vector bundles or complex vector bundles. So how are you working with these entire systems of vector bundles? So I guess that would be the kind of thing involved in studying symmetric spaces, for example. Um, for me, um, if I was going to go into that, we'll see the uh, binomial theorem, but uh, this notion of a Grassmannian, that um, just like a binomial theorem uh, talks about defining choices, uh, so you have n choose k, let's say, where it'd be n factorial over n minus k factorial times k factorial, uh, that would be the number of subsets uh, in a set, uh, subsets of size k and mm. uh, n minus k in a set of size k. You can do similar types of counting arguments uh, with a vector spaces. Uh, so like, how? what are the ways of looking at a vector space um, that's broken up into a subspace? So let's say the vector space has dimension n, the subspace has dimension k, the complement has dimension minus k, n minus k. How are the ways of doing that? Well, those are infinite typically, but let's say you're dealing with a finite field then all of a sudden those vector spaces have a countable number of elements. And so you can actually do a counting exercise. And that counting exercise, if you switch from binomial theorem to Gauss binomial coefficients, 
where you replace, let's say, the number n with a polynomial in q, which would be, let's say, 1 plus q plus q squared plus all the way to q to the n minus 1. So that would have n terms. And if you substituted uh, uh, q equals 1, you would get back n. But instead of n, you have this polynomial. And it turns out that those polynomials uh, divide each other just as the um, n, you know, uh, n choose k factorials divide each other. So just as n factorial divides uh, is divided by k factorial times n minus k factorial, so the polynomials uh, accordingly um, divide. And so uh, the Grassmannian, um, no, so you can get this version for finite fields. What the Grassmannian does is says, okay, well, let's look at the manifold you would get by looking at uh, these quotients, let's say, over the reals, okay? That would be, let's say, the real Grassmannian, and it's written out here, uh, orthogonal of m plus n over orthogonal of, uh, you know, m-dimensional cross orthogonal n-dimensional. So I guess that's the manifold for actually doing that uh, in, um, a as a manifold. But it turns out you can do all these different flavors. Uh, and that'll get you different flavors of Grassmannians. Uh, so instead of, let's say, real vector spaces, uh, real vector spaces, it could be, let's say, complex. What are the vector, real vector uh, subspaces of a complex vector matrix? I mean, vector space. Or uh, alternatively, what are the complexifiable, let's say, uh, real vector spaces in subspaces of a real vector space? So if they're complexifiable, that means that they have to... Uh, be harmonious with regard to a uh, structure that you could put on that would make them complex. So you get like eight different flavors. And somehow I think that orthogonal group of itself is counting something very much like the binomial theorem and the symplectic group, I guess, also. So mm -hmm. that's the approach I would take if I was trying to understand that is to use the binomial theorem, which we'll show is really at the heart of Clifford algebras, uh, to look at the Grassmannians, uh, to look at the... Um, symmetric spaces, and then maybe to try to understand a little bit about the vector bundles. It's really a bit optional. Really what we're doing um, for Math for Wisdom is just trying to understand like how could this pattern match over? Because you see, these are kind of like just signatures or symptoms of that pattern. You know, like you have Z, Z2, Z2, 0, Z, 0, 0, 0, Z. It's just a little uh, indicative pattern. It's not saying the entire structure of what's going on there. There's a deeper thing going on there. So um, I'm trying to figure out, well, how to read that, you know, that's very, uh, but the metaphysical point being that, um, two choices, different kinds of choices, different flavors of choices, that's metaphysical. Uh, and what, maybe just to expand on that, what it's like, what it seems to be is like, imagine, you know, we like to think that choices are independent. But imagine if they weren't. Imagine like if the second choice you make is different than the first choice, the reason being that your brain is limited. Let's say your brain is like an eight-track mind, but you only see the tracks you're using. So sometimes you have a one-track mind uh, when you're thinking about everything, but then you'll have a two-track mind when you think about existence because you need to be able to ask, well, maybe you know this uh, television exists or it doesn't, but if it does, then it does. So it's like you know free will and fate but then you might need a three-track mind. But if you have a three-track mind, like for learning, like taking a stand, falling through, reflecting, but you'll have five tracks left over that you're not even worried about. But basically when you get up to the eighth track, the whole thing collapses. Okay, so it's really maybe a seven-track mind and then you'll have like a zero track where it's just, just, you're not using your mind at all, which would be how you would model God, let's say, right? And so neurologically, if you're a materialist, you'd say, well, just like the body, you know, just like the brain has a map of the body, so when I pick up a hammer, all of a sudden I feel like my arm got longer, you know. Uh, so the brain should have a map of the mind, you see. And this would be the map of the mind. And the brain would be able to say, you have no perspectives, which would imply that you're kind of like doing something equivalent to contemplating God, let's say. But if you have one perspective, you're contemplating everything. So we're trying to find, a, I'm trying to find... A, what this be? So another metaphysical thing that comes up is it turns out, and there's a simpler um, thing back and forth between um, the unitary and the, let's say, unitary over the unitary cross unitary. So that would be a twofold periodicity, uh, which again leverages the just is in the complex world. It's a complex uh, vector spaces or complex Clifford algebras. Um, 
So if A plus 2 is 10, and it turns out in physics, in the study of topological insulators, which would be, I think they're like two-dimensional, um, but let's say you have some kind of insulator and you have some kind of, let's say, electromagnetic um, world on top of that, you can do different things, have different um, manifolds or structures where the, the physical properties become different. Okay, you, you basically like the laws of physics change depending on how you insulate something, or how you construct the space. And it'll change in three ways. Um, the notion of time reversal could be there or not. Uh, charge conjugation could be there or not. And parity could be there or not. Uh, so that would be, um, and so th these are the components of CPT symmetry, which is a very important uh, symmetry. Like you can break one or two maybe of those symmetries, but you can't break all three. So um, to uh, all three, they have to kind of like uh, work together. And that says, that ends up saying that like the weak force, it's got a certain chirality, I think. Maybe it's left-handed or something, uh, but not right-handed. Okay, so I don't know. But that's that's where this, this thing all then leads to. But for me, I just want to say like metaphysically, like these are very metaphysical notions. So for example, if there's time reversal, then something can become. But if there's no time reversal, then there's no becoming. Okay, so like there's no how. So like uh, the, the, the foursome for levels of knowledge says, well, there's whether, what, how, why. But to say there's no how, you know, that's a very metaphysical thing. Charge conjugation is basically, to my understanding, saying that, well, if you have a sea of particles, and in that sea you have some kind of hole where a particle is missing, is that hole distinguishable from an antiparticle? And in some situations it would be, and in some situations it wouldn't be. Well, that's like talking about existence or being. Like, is that hole, does it exist or does it not? You know, if it's if it's like an antiparticle, uh, maybe, you know, existence means one thing. If it's not like an antiparticle, then maybe it means another thing. Yeah, so if it's not like an antiparticle, then maybe it means just a hole. If it's not a hole, it doesn't exist, let's say, for example. Uh, and then with parity, uh, you have three dimensions. And I guess if you, I don't know exactly how it works. If you flip one dimension or all three, you know, you get a different handedness, let's say. And so um, that may relate to this like three cycle. Uh, so that's very curious. Uh, that's encouraging to think, oh, wow, there's some kind of uh, connection here. So. This is some of the deal with this, why this could be interesting. And just to say, um, any more thoughts on that? Or um, When you say <clears throat> topological insulator, and you're, you're actually talking about a two-dimensional, are you actually talking about a two-dimensional surface embedded in our space? Or are you talking about something more abstract? I am not. I, I'm not qualified to say, but I think it was my understanding. I think it's just very simple. It's like two dimensional, mm. you know, it's something very simple. So um, that's kind of curious. Um, and do these things actually exist or are they just uh, constructs at this point? I think they exist that, in the sense that this is. And in fact, this is a very important for a uh, quantum computing because mm -hmm. uh, you're creating different environments. Uh, this is one of the main uh ways that they're pursuing quantum computing. Hmm. And I think uh, it's possible, I'm not sure, that, that all of these exotic matters have been demonstrated, that this is actually a classification of exotic matters, you know, in a certain, in a certain hmm. sense. So uh, hmm. there, there may be more complicated uh, things going on, um, but there is a sense this is very real physically. I see. Now, uh, that's not, I didn't know all these things when I started, but the one thing that was encouraging when I did start was that, well, you know, I was interested in, this is how uh, we start, you know, we're old friends, but uh, when you started um, uh, opening up uh, Griffith's book in quantum physics about almost three years ago, and I was glad to join you because I really wanted to get, uh, and you have great physical insight, so I wanted to get some physical intuition to Lee theory because uh, in this wondrous wisdom, I had, uh, in the, you know, separately kind of, thought, oh, there should be, uh, based on my study of ways of figuring things out, uh, and I'm making a series of videos on, on that, uh, but there should be four geometries. And so I was very intrigued that in Lie theory, you have four classical families, um, the even orthogonal, odd orthogonal, the, the unitary, and the symplectic. Uh, and maybe each of them 
you know, has a, a, is a different geometry, you know, again, certainly each of them kind of defines a different type of rotation. So that's a kind of like a working hypothesis that I'm working on. One of the things I looked at was, well, it'd be great, you know, and this would be a great demonstration, you know, that wondrous wisdom is truly real, is if I could organize all the mathematics and show that, you know, I have this skeleton key to do that. So one of the things I did was to try to get a grip on the big picture of mathematics was I looked at the, um, I looked at the um, journals uh, in math and their system for classifying um, things. So like there's, you know, you can have an article in differential topology, you can have an article on harmonic analysis and elliptic functions, you know, modular forms, K theory. And then the question is, okay, which of these disciplines or branches depends on which other branches? So you can draw a map. So for example, um, at the bottom, you'll have we'll have things like you know geometry, real functions, uh, combinatorics, uh, mathematical logics. But at the top, you would have let's say something like number theory, which would be like a whole thing. So, but the it's not clear you know how good this is or what I learned. But the one thing I did learn was that there seemed to be two wings or two um, two main uh, things. One is uh, algebra, the other is analysis, and that they seem to come together in a geometry, but in especially like Lie groups, let's say, Lie, Lie algebras, Lie groups, is where uh, you really uh, are intermeshing. Um, it's the algebra of continuity, I guess, is one way to think about it. So you're really bringing that together. So this is the heart of mathematics. And so if you have four, you have some exceptional Lie groups algebras, but these are like the four infinite families are all related here. So that is interesting. Um, hmm, what's going on there? And the types of things is that what the thing to look for mathematically is to say, hey, I suspect, and I'm looking for like the symmetries inherent in math itself. So for example, uh, when I look at the roots, like why are there four classical families, you know, and I tried to chase down this question and I think I'm pretty satisfied with the answer I have. I have a lot more to learn about it. But if you look at the root systems of the Lie algebras, you'll see that most of them are basically all of the same form. It's like Xi minus Xj like you would have with the simplexes. So in fact, in the unitary case, uh, that's what they look like. Can you, can, uh, you, so, uh, can you remind me of root systems again? Um, so if you have a Lie group, um, it's a continuous group, yeah. and it is very much um, determined um, by what's happening at any point locally, because yes. it's a continuous group. And so it has a tangent space, that tangent space is uh, multidimensional, and it's described by the Lie algebra. Yes. And the skeleton for that Lie algebra would be the root system. So these root systems are super, uh, in, extremely symmetrical, um, and uh, you know where they're very tight systems. I mean, so basically it could be like, um, you know, uh, six arrows, sixty degrees separated. That would be, you know, the root system for A three, which I think would be like for SU three. Let's say, right? That'd be A2 for SU3. Um, that's a classical one. But they could also be, let's say, like, um, well, if they're just like square, then those would be independent. Okay. Now, like are, they related, are they related to the Lie bracket? Yes. So Lie algebra is uh, building on the Lie bracket. And so when you do, uh, when you have a Lie algebra, you don't really have multiplication. Uh, you have instead the Lie bracket operation, which is saying, well, like, you know, X and Y, X bracket Y would be X, Y minus Y, X, let's say. Mm. Uh, if you were able to write that Lie algebra as you typically can, you know, is a matrix algebra. So, but X, Y wouldn't make sense by itself and minus Y, X would make sense. But right, the right. bracket um, makes sense uh, in this concept of Lie algebra. Mm. So when you have that... Um, um, Okay, so you get these, uh, that's like the kind of like uh, logic of it. And it ends up being logic about these roots. And there's very few possibilities. So uh, you get these chains, basically. Uh, and these chains, uh, you just maybe have a chain all, all by itself. Uh, and so that would be things like, you know, x sub 4 minus x3, x3 minus x2, x2 minus x1. Or you could do plus or minus the whole thing. But that, that, that'd be your roots. And so what I'm saying as a combinatorialist is that like, that's encoding counting, you see. So if you count one, two, three, four, five, you know, how would you encode that? You encount it like x sub two minus x one is encoding the idea that you, when you have one, you will go to two. 
And when you have two, you will go to three, you see. So each root is telling you how to do the counting uh, up to, you know, N, whatever N is. And then the crucial thing about counting is that it has a symmetry that when you count forward, you can also count backwards, you see. So it turns out that there's uh, three other kinds of symmetries in counting that you could have. And you, what you do is you add a widget at the end, you know, or you, 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 and so there are three kinds of widgets that you could do, which will give you three, three other systems. So one is you could basically, and so this comes up um, in, in practical life for historians, um, you know, they want to be able to count forward, but you know, then how do you, you have to have a year where you start from, right? Cause you can't start from negative infinity. So then you need to be able to count backwards, right? And so how do you connect those two counting systems? And probably most people don't even think about it. They don't really know, but you have to make a choice. And so there's three possible choices how you could do that, you see. Um, so one choice would be um, um, to add a zero, you see. And so then you would have, let's say, uh, negative two minus one, zero, one, two, three. Okay, so the, instead of saying one, two, three, and then the opposite would be, let's say, um, negative three minus two minus one, you'd say, well, we're going to link them together. Okay, because like in the complexes, you could say, let's say one, two, three, and then you can say negative three, negative two, negative one, but they're, un they're disconnected. They're, they don't have a connection. But you can connect them with a zero. And then that will be another solution. Okay, so how would you do that? Well, you add a root x sub one. And then what happens, uh, when you add x sub one, it's going to... Um, let me see how this works. Yeah, when you add an x sub one, it's kind of like adding an x one minus x naught where x naught is zero, okay? So it's like you're counting from zero to one, basically. Okay. D define x sub naught equals zero, x sub one minus uh, zero, so that'll be one, and then that'll work in both directions because you can multiply. And then this, but this, this will have a huge influence. It'll kind of rip open the, like, these are like floorboards. And you're kind of like ripping open the floorboards and getting down to the foundation of the building. You're saying, well, if X sub one exists, then you can add these, X sub two will exist, then you can add them, X sub three will exist, and you'll get this whole thing underneath. And then those things will be related, I think, by um, 90 degrees. You see, the X sub one and X sub two won't be connected, they'll be independent. See, X sub one and X sub two minus X one, they'll be related by 45 degrees. I think that's what, whereas these will all be related by 120 degrees, you know, they'll be related by 135, I should say, degrees. These will be related by 120 degrees, so it's just like 90 plus 30. Anyway, so you can link them by having zero. You can link them, another way though is you could fuse them. So instead of having a zero, you could have like, a, you could say, let's just identify one and minus one. Okay, let's say that's the same year. So instead of adding a year zero, you say, look, the year one and the year minus one will be the same. That's what you'll get if you add a root x1 plus x2, okay? And then if you, um, another is you just fold it. You don't have a zero. You just say, when we get to minus one, we will get to one and then two and then three. So if you work out the algebra, that's what it seems to be encoding. That's very interesting, at least for me. Like that's an explanation, like what's going on here that's cognitive. Um, and so um, it's not kind of venturing away from bot periodicity, so I want to kind of move on. Any th any thoughts on that, or is that? Uh... Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just a little bit. Um, so, so these root systems, what kind of algebraic structure do they have? What what is the what is the out? They're they're an algebra, right? Or well, they... maybe I've I've forgot. You know, to be fair, I've forgotten everything. This has been a, several years, so I'm just trying to say, like, this is the answer. But the point is, is that. There is this answer here, you know, which I would have to spell out more, saying that th there's a symmetry in counting between backwards and forwards. There's ways of connecting backwards and forwards together, okay? So this is the kind of thing that, um, um, the kind of symmetry that'd be at the heart of mathematics, where like math is describing math, right? Like the things that we take for granted in math, how, are they, how does math deal with them? Here's another one, um, like, um, when you have a matrix um, in these um, Lie groups, let's say, right, and you look at the inverses, normally you would have to do something very complicated with Cayley's theorem 
right? Like you'd have to take determinants over determinants, etc. But what this says in these uh, cases of the rotations, um, it's very easy to take the inverse. You just uh, do the transpose. Now you have three different types of transpose. You can, so instead of X goes to Y, which would be, let's say, MXY, uh, the transpose would be MYX, right? You know, so MXY codes an arrow from X to Y, and then it goes from Y to X in the other way. But you could also be coding complex, uh, in which case you'd have to worry about two arrows you're encoding, or quaternions, that might be like four arrows, you see, or, or basically information, or maybe two complexes, let's say. So that's maybe a little bit too far. So what I, what I really wanted to talk about is the progress I'm trying to make to understand bot periodicity. But the point of this was that uh, what bot periodicity, I think, is doing is that it's saying that, like, in something like a matrix, you know, if matrices are one way of looking at the, you know, the external relationships in math. So like, you know, it's an arrow from an arrow. Like in category theory is basically encoding the same types of things as matrices are. What are the possible symmetries inherent in that? And the idea is that, you know, it's really about two by two matrices and what can you do with them? And there's only so many symmetries that you can get playing with two by two matrices. And in the end, you'll just get back to where you started. Like if you fold up those matrices in all the different ways, then you kind of like run out of possibilities. That's what, that's what this is about. So, um, so maybe that was a long tangent. So what I'd like to do is just to maybe say what I'm really focusing on now is trying to understand uh, how to calculate those numbers. And so those numbers, uh, this is the, the basic answer. Uh, it, it is given by uh, Atia Bott and Shapiro in a paper that they wrote, uh, published in 1963 called Clifford Modules. Uh, so this is four years after Bott figured out this thing. And it's because they kind of realized um, that uh, Clifford modules have this same periodicity. And they tried to link it up. So the first paper just kind of like uh, showed that it is the same periodicity, but didn't really explain like how to, uh, how, why. And so in subsequent papers, they, they found a deeper reason, you know, why do these patterns match up? Um, Dexter Chu was a Harvard was a Harvard grad student. He wrote up this uh, this thing. The first chapter was helpful for me as a more simpler explanation of this. And then uh, there's actually a book by Dale Hughes Muller on fiber bundles, which goes in much more detail. It's even more helpful, uh, but it's still very hard for me. So the gist is this: uh, Where do you get z2? Where do you get z? And where do you get um, zero from? Is that uh, basically it's how matrices can fit together. And so in the practical sense, it's probably something really almost trivial. Okay, so this is the kind of trivial thing. Like, here's the way you would represent uh, complex numbers. And when you gave your talk uh, presentation on complex numbers, this is what you show that they look like, right? Like you have A on the diagonal and minus B and B on the, uh, the anti-diagonal. Now, suppose that you have this, but you're only going to look at the real component. And one way to argue that is to say, well, the complex part is odd. You see, it's going to be a, a, a generator. It's the first generator. One is an odd number. We're going to ignore it. We're just going to look at the subalgebra. That's the real. Well, when you do that, all of a sudden, you lose these um, ant the anti-diagonal elements. You get a breakdown. This was an irreducible representation, but now this is two copies of irreducible, you know, of irreducibles in the reals. So you're getting a product in the reals. So this, what was an irreducible from this point of view, uh, from the complexes, from the real point of view, you would, it would be um, two copies of an irreducible. And so that's Z2. You see, that's what Z2 is saying. And so um, they make it more complicated. They say, well, let's take the representation of complex numbers, uh, which is there's only one of them, but let's imagine the uh, group, let's imagine the module of all the representations of complex numbers up to isomorphism. So instead of one, you would be able to have, you know, as many copies of this as you like. Uh, so that would be all the natural numbers. And then you could say, oh, let's do a Grothendieck construction where we would make a group out of that. So then you would just uh, 
presume that all of these have inverses, and then you would show, well, that, mon that monoid can be thought of as a group. And so then that group would be Z, okay? So this would be Z. But this would be, uh, when you map this into that, it, you would get 2Z mapping into Z. And then Z over 2Z is going to be Z2. So th there's a very complicated way just to say what was very simple here is that like 2 equals 2 times 1, right? Any questions about that? Uh, well, I mean, okay. I, it just seems like just playing around with... <laughs> with inconsequentials but it, it i mean obviously they're talking about more general context for that whole circle of ideas i mean um well it's not clear like so in the case of clifford algebra is like they use a super high abstract machinery but when you like why to you know to calculate z2 see but the, the answer is, well, it's really, if you, the representation of complex numbers, when you break it down like this, you know, then yep. it's two, you see. It really is just two equals two times one. So uh, that's one of the points of what we're doing is to learn how to talk about this in simple ways. <laughs> okay. Then the other one, so, and then Wedderburn theorem we're using is that like all, a, a matrix algebra of R comma C or H has only one irreducible representation, the natural representation, you see. so. You can have very complicated, you know, math, but the, in the end, the answer is going to be trivial. There's only one irreducible representation, you see, mm -hmm. in those cases. If you have um, something like R plus R, C plus C, or H plus A, then Wedderburn says there's two representations. And I think uh, the way to look at it would be, let's say, if uh, you could have like A, element A plus element B, or element A minus element B those would give you two different representations. The reason that you'd want to do that is because um, I think you want both of them to include, see, if you have an algebra, you want both of them to contain the number one, right? So the number one, for the, if this is an algebra, the number one would be one plus one, right? That would be the, the unit. So you need uh, your representations to basically contain that. I'm a little confused uh, myself. I have to go back to this. Anyways, but, the, but it's believable that this has two representations. Now, when you put this inside of, let's say, a four-dimensional, you know, I mean, the, the two-by-two two matrix of the reals, you're going to get um, Z, because this only has one representation, let's say, and you're going to get Z plus Z. And when you calculate it out, you're going to be left with a Z. So it's kind of like, you know, two minus one equals one. That's, I have, to, I have to work out on the math. It's just a mess trying to understand this, but that's really, you know, that's what will it be? And then zero, the trivial group, is just saying that when you have uh, Clifford algebras and you're comparing them, if the matrices are the same size, basically, um, then they're the same size, there's no difference, okay? So you get zero. So there's this huge deal trying to understand that pattern, but that is the, the source of the pattern right there that I'm still working to understand. Any comments on that? Or? Uh, yeah, so I'm not quite sure I got the gist of this pattern here. Um, and so this is the pattern back here, um, going around this clock. So the pattern would be like complexes compared to the reals will have this Z2. Okay. Because the complex... And the quaternions compared to the complexes will have Z2. Okay. okay. Now, depending, now if you have H plus A compared to H, I think that's using the same size matrices. Okay. And somehow, like, it, somehow this gives you zero. But if you have the two by two matrices, that's what this H on the bottom is saying. It's like two by two matrices in quaternions. Compare it with the sum of these quaternions. I think it's called the split by quaternions. This Z will come out. This guy has two representations. This guy has only one representation. I guess so Z plus Z over Z is going to be Z. Something like that. Okay. When you do the math. Then, uh, see, when you have... Um, and then maybe the point... So when you have this uh, uh, quaternions, when you uh, put the... Um, when you go further... What's going to happen is that instead of matrices of quaternions, you'll have matrices of complexes. 
so in that case, um, the matrices, um, well, you don't, you just get the zero in, in the zero. Like it doesn't, it doesn't mind. It, it, they're the matrices are the same size. They're the same size, you know, go from the complexes back to the reals. And then you get to the reals again, you have the same issue from before that you did for the quaternion. So that's basically the deal. Why don't I go further down? It'll be maybe a little bit more helpful um, to see what's up. So we have to just be a little bit more clear, like what is a Clifford algebra? And they really do extend the binomial theorem. So you have the reals and then you add generators. If you add, and now with these generators, let's say that to start, let's say the generators, when you square them, you get negative one. So if you, the first generator will just give you C, you'll have one and E to the one. The second generator though, if you have E1 and E2, you're allowed to multiply them together. That'll give you a third basis element, um, E1, E2. So like if this is I and this is J, I times J is K. Okay, and so you get four, the quaternions have four basis elements, but they only have two generators uh, needed to construct that. And so then for H plus H, it turns out that you can get this, uh, this would be one, you need a third generator, you'll get pairs of generators and you can have them all three. Of course, if you multiply more because a generator squared is one, you'll just never get um, more possibilities. This goes through all the possibilities. In each level, you can continue. It'll be two to the K. Is the generator squared one or negative one? Uh, in this case, for this diagram, it is assumed that it's negative one. Okay. But for you could also set it to one or you could also set it to zero. Those would all work. The zero case is uh, degenerate, and it is actually very important for the Grossmannian, for the external algebra. So sorry, in the sorry, reals... Yeah, for the three-sum H plus H, am I missing... It? Is that running off the right right side of the diagram there? Uh, I'm you not, see I'm E1, not, E2, E3? You, I'm not seeing E1, E2, E3 multiplied together. Is that on the right? It is, right. Okay. I'm sorry. I right. see it, but you don't see it. So... Um, in fact, maybe I'll just... Uh, okay, so you're saying that, that this is a Clifford... Okay, so Clifford algebras. So the reals complexes, quaternions, uh, fit in a in this chain of Clifford algebras. Right. Okay, but and then so, you... And so the question is, how do you calculate them? You can see, like, you know, they're easy to define. It's basically the binomial theorem. You know, you know it, you're going to keep going. Uh, yes. It's very much like in the video I created, you know, the binomial theorem is a portal to your mind because you're deciding whether to include a generator or not. So here you're making three choices, and you only choose mm -hmm. to include one of them. Here you chose to include two of them. Mm -hmm. Here you chose to include all three. Here you chose to include none of them. So it really is relevant. And so... You also get this very important distinction between choosing none of them, which would give you the identity, choosing yeah. all of them. And this will function as a what's called a pseudo scalar. So it turns out like that this is, um, yeah, this is a very important, uh, like in terms of the character of what this is all, the patterns that are unfolding. The other thing uh, that's very important for the structure of the Clifford algebra is that EI times EJ is equal to negative EJ EI. So there's this like ordering phenomenon, like where E1, E2 is going from left to right. But if you go from right to left, you would have to switch it to negative. Okay. So combinatorial, like, you know, are you reading from left to right? Are you reading from right to left? Are you switching from one view to the other? If you are, then you need to uh, introduce a negative sign. And that's what makes it interesting. Um, so now how do we figure out like this H plus H in the... The way you have to do it is you use these formulas. And I don't have the um, logic written out here. But basically, once you know the most simple ones, so the simplest ones would be, let's say, R, C, which we looked at, R plus R, which would be like if you had the generator that's squared to positive one, right? That would be R plus one. Then you could have, let's say, two of them. Like so one is the Hamiltonians. If you have... Uh, you mean the Quaternions? You mean the quaternions? Right, the quaternions. I apologize. Uh, then um, M2R, that'd be two by two matrices in the reals. That's what you get if both are positive, if both generators are positive. Now, a very interesting thing has happened is, first of all, if both are positive, let's say EI squares to one, EJ squares to one. But if you multiply them together, EI, e, you know, E1, E2, and you square them, so that would be E1 times E2 times E1 times E2, well, what happens? The E1, E2, you have to 
uh, and I, I could try to draw this. Let's see if, I, well, I'd have to switch my screen. I guess it'd be a problem. They, I'll just say it. I don't know if you'll catch me, but E1 time, E1, E2 times E1 times E2, you switch the middle E1, E2. That gives you a minus sign. So you have E1 squared times E2 squared and both sides. So it's negative one, you see. So when you have, um, you can have each generator separately, you know, squares to one. But when you multiply them together, it can square to minus one. That kind of thing can happen. That's what makes it interesting and complicated and, you know, it gives you all the structure. Now, it turns out uh, if you have one positive uh, you know, a generator and one, you know, that squares to negative one. So let's say E1 squares to positive one, E2 squares to negative one. Then when you square, when you multiply the E1, E2, you will get positive one. Now it turns out, so then in your basis, you have two things that square to positive one and one thing that squares to negative one. It turns out that in each case, it turns out to give you the same algebra, two by two matrices but they've been uh, graded differently, so to speak. You see, the grading will work differently. What do you mean but by the, grading? The algebra will be the same. So the grading is very important. So the grading is deciding right here, like uh, how to, what to assign E1 to, what to assign E1, E2 to, you see. So if this, you know, so the grading is kind of like, um, well, the grading would be going down these diagonals, like, you know, you have one, then you have E1 or E2, then you have both. And so you can go on and on and on like that. Um, you know, E1, E2, E3, E1, E2, E3, E4, you know, you get this kind of natural grading. Uh, we're going to be looking at grading um, of evens and odds, you see. So these are, let's say, all odd. The, this, this diagonal is even, that's trivial, but these are odd, that's one generator, but these have two generate, pairs of generators, so that's even, but three generators altogether, that's odd, and so each diagonal would give you, you know, switching odd or even. Does that make sense? Um, I think so. I think I'm, I'm loosely following that. <clears throat> yeah, and so what happens is that um, to calculate in a familiar form um, the, what these, you know, because these are very... I mean, it's simple to understand, but it's hard to intuit. Well, what does that really equate to? As an algebra, you know, and a Clifford algebra is more than just an algebra because Clifford algebra has these identifications, right? But if you ignore the identifications, you just say, well, okay, what does this end up uh, being as an algebra? Um, you start with R, then you can choose, you know, it's either uh, R plus R or C, depending on which it generates R. Then it's either H or if you choose one of each, um, squaring to positive, squaring to negative, then it would be M2R, two by two matrices in R. Or if they're both positive, it's also M2R. And then it turns out once you know that, then the rest you can do by, um, by tensoring. So um, the Clifford algebra is saying, okay, in the complex case, you see, you don't distinguish between generators that square to one or negative one because you have scalars that are complex. And so it turns out that distinction doesn't, uh, it doesn't lead to anything. It's just the number of uh, okay. generators that you have. Okay. But in the reals, it does matter. So you have to keep track of both. So like, let's say, so if you have P plus two comma Q, let's say P plus two positive ones and Q negative ones, well, you'll say you added two, That'll come, those two will come from the two by two matrices cross Q comma P. So it's like, you know, flipping on all around. Okay. So two by two matrices will be flipping. If you're just adding one of each, that's tensoring also with the two by two matrices. Um, if, you're, if you're adding, like we will be doing uh, negative ones. So for us, typically P will be zero. So then, you know, Q just keeps growing. But then you do it quaternions. You're tensoring by the quaternions, but you're tensoring with the reverse you know, where it's Q positive ones, let's say, right? So if you want to know P of Q plus two, you have to flip it around and go, okay, let's say there were Q positive ones. And then, well, okay, then they would become negative ones. And then you would also uh, add two more. And then, but do you get that by tensor with the quaternion? So there's a, uh, there's a homomorphism that builds that, that I have to write down and show and work with. And I'm also trying to do it in practice, but basically it gives you the, these uh, constructions where you're braiding back and forth, like, you know, um, this is the case that we have is here. Well, let's say we start with R. 
So the next two would be the quaternions, H. That's H tensor R. But then to do the end, you'd have to go H tensor M2 of R cross R. That's uh, Clifford 4. Then H tensor M2 tensor H tensor R, that would be M, that's four by four matrices in the quaternions, that'd be Clifford 6. And then so on, H tensor, and you know, you get six, uh, R by 16, you know, eight by eight, it'd be 16 by 16 matrices R. Now it turns out, by Morita equivalence, it's saying once you get to 16 by 16 matrices in R, if you look at the, from a category theory point of view, if you looked at the representation theory of that, like the homomorphisms, you know, like that go between these matrices and stuff, it's the same category theory as you would have for R. It looks the same, basically. So from a certain point of view, like this is indistinguishable from R structurally. You know, from the outside, you can see the difference. But if you're inside the structure, you can't tell the difference because they're isomorphic. Uh, so that's that's where the periodicity comes in here uh, in the Clifford world. And then you can also, because this is even, you can also start with C and then you'll get H plus H, M4, uh, four by four matrices in C, or you'll get the sum of eight by eight matrices in R. So this is the kind of thing that's going. Now, from the point of view of Morita equivalence, it turns out that like, if you're working with four by four matrices in C, it's the same as if you were working with just C. I think that's the case. So another way to look at the bot period, this is like if you have all four negative, uh, you know, ones that squared are negative uh, generators, that gives you two by two matrices and quaternions. But if you have all four that are positive, that also gives you two by two matrices and the quaternions. So, um, so that's also, you know, you end up in the same place. So that's also uh, eight. It's just saying plus four and minus four is eight. So maybe this is kind of like where I should uh, stop. Here's the formula that I need to explain. So these groups, which we call like A sub K, that'd be, let's say, Z2 or Z or zero. What you do is you take the Clifford algebra for K. Uh, you look at, and these are the even graded representations. So that would be saying that uh, when you do the matrix representation, but ignore all the odd generators. So we kind of did that up here. Um, we said, look, ignore the in imaginary number. That's odd, right? That's a first generator. Just look at this. Well, then this will break down. So the even graded modules uh, will be this, these things separately. Okay. No, let's see. Uh, I have to think about that. But you have to have this concept of the even graded module where you keep things separate part. And this relates very much to spin because spin has to do with, you know, the even uh, parts of uh, Clifford algebras. Then what you have to do, and I'll just finish with this thought, I think, you include, you have this map I that maps, uh, includes the kth Clifford algebra into the k plus first where all the generators are negative. I. So you have in this inclusion, how do you work backwards? Well, if you have an even graded um, module, let's say, of a Clifford algebra that's bigger by one generator, it turns out that those, um, when you think backwards, so when you're including, you can include a smaller Clifford algebra into the bigger one just by thinking of it as a subalgebra. That's easy. It turns out with representations, you can go backwards from the bigger one to the smaller one by saying, look, if I have defined a representation that works on the bigger one, it'll also be a representation of the smaller one. Does that make sense? Like, like here. Yeah, that's the point. See, this is a representation of the complexes, right? No, I, I think I see. I, I think I see the point. Yeah, this is a representation of the complexes. But if you looked at and you, then if you looked and if it's even graded, this would just go to zero. But it's also a representation of the reals. But as a representation of the reals, you see it breaks up into two modules. So this is where you're kind of, and so then you're looking at the quotient. You're saying, okay, here, you know, you had a two by two thing, and here, you see, one, and also it's saying, look, there was only one representation here. So this M is Z because it's, there's only one representation here. But when you map this into that, you see, you'll map like uh, into the, you'll be mapping two to one. So you get Z over two Z, which is Z two. I see. 
So you see how so elaborate this is. Like you have to know about Morita equivalents. You have to know about graded representations. You have to know about like, you know, representations, you know, an inclusive map and back and forth. But see, that's just mathematical uh, baggage. You <laughs> see? Yeah. Really, like you could tell it, you know, you could tell a high school student, you know, well, someone, if they know two by two matrices, you can explain that this is what it is. And there may be a simpler math. There hmm. probably is a simpler math to do it. You don't really need the real numbers to talk about this. You can probably just use Z2, you see. Hmm. Mm -hmm. The whole real numbers is just like um, canvas, right? Like it's wrapper. It's not relevant here anywhere. So, the point is to understand this, first of all, like, well, what is this really saying, right? But what you can see is you can start to see something like the two sum. You see, because it's saying like opposites coexist or it's all the same, you see? Hmm. So that type of distinction uh, is already creeping in here very, very dramatically. Uh, so, so Andrew, so I do, I have to get to a meeting at work, um, so. Okay, so then that's what I wanted to show you. Any okay. last comments? Maybe I'll stop sharing. Yeah, no, uh, I mean, I, it's it, it it's sort of coming into focus. I mean, to some to some degree, it's coming into greater focus. Um, I, I mean, so it seems like bot periodicity can be explained on all these different tracks. Bot's original track mm -hmm. explained in terms of, of, embeddings of symmetric spaces it can be explained in terms of clifford algebras um am i am i correct here that and and then you're saying that you're saying that there's simple cases where you can see the bot periodicity kind of emerging uh in that case of the breakdown of the complex numbers um and and all the cases are that simple maybe like the concluding thing would well or just i'll just say it verbally like when you go up the clifford see the two building blocks are like uh, two by two real matrices you're tensoring by, or you're tensing by the quaternions. When you tensor by the quaternions, you know, or this whole notion, it's like the inner structure. So like complex numbers, you, you talked about this choice. You can, by fiat, say I have a I, or you can construct it. Basically, you end up with two by two matrices, right? Yeah. So you can do either way. And so this is like explicit representation or implicit structure. Hmm. So if you go the route of implexic structure, you get these Z2s. So, you know, R to C to H. But if you keep going that route, in the end, you collapse back into this external thing where it's saying, like, you have to, you end up using matrices. When you use matrices, the quaternions are very sparse, you see, in like four by four matrices, they're sparse. Hmm. Then you use the same size matrices, let's say, with the complexes, basically. You use the same size matrices, something like with the reals, you see, like, they fill in the space. And so you have all this space that was sparse, it gets filled back in. So the matrices don't grow anymore or whatever. So you get these zeros. You see, there's no growth necessary for the matrices. Hmm. Whereas for the something like that, you see. So hmm. the conclusion is that it's something very simple going on. It has very deep consequences in all these like most hmm. deep things in mathematics. It's related to the symmetry inherent in math itself. Like how can you fold up a matrix? You know, how does internal structure and external representation relate? And so if we could understand it simply from a math point of view, like in the high school or community college kid could understand, then that's the level that would relate to uh, the wondrous wisdom. But already like this two sum creeps in, looking mm -hmm. for like where could the three cycle creep in. And just, uh, just to say a prayer of thanks. Um, yeah. Original content by Andrus Kulikauskas and Math for Wisdom are in the public domain for you and all to share, use, and reuse in your own best judgment. I, Andrus Kulikowska, certify my fair use of Wikipedia in this video. Authors of Wikipedia, thank you. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. So I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, and he's also a big, big fan, a supporter, you know, of my work. And um, we just, we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And 
you know, I'm just, I'm grateful and, you know, I, I want to support that and, you know, our weekly or bi, you know, semi-weekly or bi-weekly conversations have been, have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So, yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.